you want to be at a soft table, right? You want to be the dominant player at that table. You want to find your mark, so to speak, of, of the fish that you're going to make money off. In the markets, that doesn't exist. You are playing with the big boys right from the start. So, Evan, welcome to the podcast. How's it going today? Doing great. Thanks so much for having me. Awesome. Pleasure to have you here. I know we talked a few, I think, months or, or weeks back to schedule an interview and finally made it. So I'm happy to have you here. Um, you are a systems trader. So we'll talk about systems and how you've been able to build those and how you kind of trade and also your story. For people that don't know you right now, can you tell people a bit about, about yourself and what you do? Sure thing. Uh, so I'm a trader and uh, I own and operate uh, the traderisk.com, which is uh, a website all around trading education and technical analysis about the stock market. Uh, so we do a lot of uh, quantitative systems and fun stuff like that over there. Uh, my background is computer science. Uh, so I went to school for computer science um, and I worked as a software developer for about seven or so years before transitioning kind of full time to trading and the trade risk. Nice. Awesome. I want to kind of go back a bit in time and can you tell people how was the first moment when you began to trade and how did that kind of story started? So we have to go back to my college years uh, when I started to get into trading and um, I did not have any formal financial, uh, you know, anybody in the mar uh, anybody in my family, you know, none of them were into finance or trading. Uh, I didn't take any classes in school. Um, I, uh, back in college, was consumed with poker, uh, No Limit Texas Hold'em. Uh, that is what dominated pretty much all of my time. Uh, and I took the game really serious, learning the ins and outs, trying to, you know, really, um, you know, beat the game of poker, so to speak. And uh, I used to, for anybody on the East Coast of the United States, I uh, used to go to the casinos, Foxwoods and Mohegan Sun, used to make the trips out there and play there. But I used to play a ton online as well, 10 to 15 hands, all at, uh, tables all at once. And that was my life. And I was going down that path of becoming a poker player, uh, so to speak. And um, around 2007 and eight is when the landscape for online poker in the United States really started to collapse in on itself. And basically, uh, the governments were saying, nope, you can't operate here anymore, full tilt and poker stars. Um, we're no longer going to accept US players. And when that happened, uh, it was kind of like a you know, an oh shit moment of what am I going to do with all this time? Um, I just spent all, you know, of this mental energy uh, into this game of probabilities and, and playing other people and uh, bankroll management, all this fun stuff. And uh, it was around that time when kind of the community of, of poker players that I was uh, in touch with, a lot of them were saying, well, it's back to the stock market for me. And I had no idea what the stock market was, uh, did, did not you know, I knew what it was, but, you know, not really. And um, when I heard of enough of the poker players kind of going back to, quote unquote, the stock market, I said, well, time to time to investigate this, opened up a brokerage account and just tried my tried my hand at, at trading at that time. Awesome. And how did that go uh, the first time? Did you succeed from the start or did you have some tough times and things to go through first? A little bit of both. Um, so I, I think it was um, kind of the worst thing that can happen to a new trader, which is doing really well uh, at the beginning, right? And it, and it's like, it's the curse. It's great and it's bad because you get hooked and you think you're a genius. Um, but, you know, you're forever in love with the market right when you start and you make money. Um, what I didn't realize is it had nothing to do uh, with what I was doing. I was simply... Uh, you know, at the time, and I didn't even realize it, but I was basically buying in the 2008, 2009 lows. Um, and um, I was just getting lucky by the current of the market. I had no understanding of the magnitude of the meltdown that just happened uh, right before I started to trade. Um, it was all just totally over my head. But, um, you know, my first six months, my first year, I did really well. And it was all again, totally shooting by the hip. And kind of trading what I knew uh, in terms of companies. Um, and, you know, after that first six or 12 months, I said, well, time to buy some books, time to get educated. Uh, I'm, I'm really going to do good now because uh, this first year was, you know, I crushed it. Um, so I can't wait to see what I can do with a few books under my belt. 
And that's when the real sort of roller coaster started is as soon as I started to educate myself, as soon as I tried to get clever and play with options and do some simple technical analysis, that's when I realized, okay, I really don't know a whole lot. Um, and this is a much deeper game than sort of I originally thought. But, um, you know, that, you know, so, so the, the, the story of doing well at the beginning certainly hooked me in. And then, um, you know, I transitioned, I, I jumped into the markets really day trading and day trading aggressively um, and using options. So again, just a total uh, recipe for disaster. Um, and I definitely took my lumps. I think I Blew, uh, I blew up two accounts, uh, you know, when I started. Um, so I definitely uh, felt the pain uh, of drawdown and risk management, which were concepts I had learned in poker, certainly, um, but hadn't fully translated them to the market yet. Um, and especially with options, these were new instruments to me. So, um, so yeah, I mean, slowly but surely, uh, I eventually transitioned out of day trading slowed down the time frame, um, slowed down the trading, pulled back the time frame, uh, started to do more swing trading. That is where most of my time research energy has been spent over the past 11 or 12 years. Trading is in the swing trading uh, kind of spectrum. Uh, and that's certainly been my sweet spot. And um, now it's it's pretty codified and systematic. But um, the majority of my trading career was sort of discretionary and technical in nature. What exactly did you, did you have to do to be able to become profitable and consistent in trading? Because I guess a lot of people are going to see that and they're going to be successful from the start. But then what did you have to do to be able to maintain that over time? You know, uh, certainly a combination of luck, uh, mostly luck. I, I think the luck is is being delusional enough to continue, right? To blow up one account and then to come back and say, oh yeah, I can. I should still do this, right? And then a year later, you you, you blow up another account, and, and yeah, I, I should still continue, right? Like, there's there's something you know uh, a little bit crazy to to kind of continue uh, in that spectrum. I think there was a quote, or I, I'm totally going to butcher it, but something along the lines of um, you have to just stay solvent enough to learn all the things you shouldn't be doing in the market. It's basically a, a trial of, of figuring out all the things you shouldn't be doing. And, and once you can put enough, kind of cover up enough holes and fix those leaks, you can start breaking even and you can start trying to make some money. Um, but, you know, for me, um, you know, ultimately I think what got me to uh, the right side, the good path, so to speak, is uh, eventually having enough self-awareness to understand where my edge was, where it wasn't, and the type of trading that I should or should not be doing. Uh, so um, I wrote about this in a blog post. This is many years back now, but the aha moment to get out of day trading into swing trading was when I was sort of paying my tax or doing taxes and looking over the years kind of trading summary. And I was trading with Scott Trade at the time. This is back when commissions were still a thing. Um, and I was actively day trading with Scott Trade, a relatively small account or right around the pattern day trader rule. And um, I looked at my commission cost for the year and I had paid them about seventeen or $18,000 in commissions. Uh, my account size was about $25,000. So the math there is just was just so eye opening. It, it just it it made me realize like, you know, I was diving into book after book and after book for strategy. Um, but all the strategy in the world wouldn't have helped me because I was, you know, had an 80 percent rake to my broker and um, I needed to fix that. So, um, you know, it, I guess these are all anecdotes of like the small things of, of kind of just reflecting on the trading, the results and making tweak after tweak and just continuing to sort of grind it out. Um, but it takes documenting and, and again, some self-awareness to sort of look at what's working, what's not try and eliminate what wasn't working and try and spend more time with what was working. Mm -hmm. I know a few people that went from playing poker to, to moving to trading. And people watching this might be doing the same. So what do you think that a poker player needs to learn that they don't learn in, in poker to be able to move to trading? What is the, the lacking piece there? Hmm. Yeah, that's a good question. Um, so there's a few things. I think the, the number one thing that comes to mind uh, for me 
was um, in poker, um, online or live, there's a thing called table selection, right? Where you want to be at a soft table, right? You want to be the dominant player at that table. You want to find your mark, so to speak, of, of the fish that you're going to make money off of. Um, in the markets, that doesn't exist. You are playing with the big boys right from the start. So you have just a much higher hurdle right from the beginning of, of, of what you need to know. Um, so that, that table selection and, and, and it's, it's always something that, that really stuck out to me. Uh, I think, you know, a couple of other things, you know, coming from the poker world, um, you know, I would just focus on, on the statistics of it. Um, and, you know, think about, especially if you're coming from the online poker world, we used to have a lot of like heads up displays that you could keep on your uh, poker tables and you could track the stats of, of um, other opponents that you were playing with. And this became super important to me uh, as, as someone that played 10, 15 tables at once. Um, and I think like keeping that mindset, I mean, just something to continue on in, when you start thinking about trading and your statistics, um, the statistics are there. You're not tracking other people. It's all internal statistics, but you need to recreate that, that poker HUD, if you will. Um, if that's a familiar term for anyone out there that, that is playing online in poker, uh, you need to create that dashboard for yourself so you can actually figure out again, kind of what's working, what isn't track those trade setups, track your PL, figure out where things went wrong. Um, that that's sort of what I would I would stick more on uh, from from that poker world. Mm -hmm. Interesting. So you mentioned being now a systems trader. I'm curious to hear what made you switch from discretionary to system trading exactly. Yeah, yeah. Um, well, uh, so certainly my background helped. Uh, so studying computer science in school and working um, as a software developer, it you know to me I almost I kick myself on not getting there faster. Um, just because my background certainly aligned with it. It almost makes you wonder, why didn't you just do that from the beginning? Um, but, you know, basically my path uh, slowly just built more and more systematic tools around my discretionary trading. So kind of the way I like to think about it now is uh, I always tell kind of people or traders that I'm working with or, or um, writing code for is that um, not everyone should be or needs to be a fully quantitative systems trader. Like I know that's a very popular kind of thing now, more and more, you're just seeing more and more, um, you know, discussion around it, I suppose. Um, I think there's actually a great spot between the hybrid sort of very rules-based or you have your processes and tools all around you and you can kind of execute in this little box. And, 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 I, and I really like this analogy, and this is slowly how the transition happened for me. It certainly wasn't a uh, wake up one day and me thinking, oh, I should, I should be a systems trader. It, 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 was a 10 year, it was 10 years in the making. Um, it was basically every year that went by, um, I added another tool into my trading process, right? So for instance, the very, very beginning, first thing I created was like a position size calculator, right? So hopefully everybody has some type of position size calculator that they use. Um, but that's just a simple example of a tool where I didn't have to just freestyle, oh, I'll buy 500 shares today. No, no, like I, I have a process, I put in where I'm gonna enter, where I'm gonna exit, you know, volatility, all that fun stuff. And it tells me how many shares. And so that was like the first tool I built out. And then, you know, as I, as I continue on, I just think about the, the flows that I had to continue to check every day. So for instance, if there was a particular type of price action pattern, let's say bull flags, right? And, and I just, I always scan the market every day for bull flags. Well, eventually I write, wrote the scans and the actual, you know, code to screen for those specific stocks. So I don't actually have to go out there and page through 5,000 charts. Um, and, and find a candidate. I, I had tools to actually do it for me. And so basically right down the line every year, I sort of added something new uh, of a tool and a framework to, to, to trade within. And by like year five or six, 
you know, I essentially had the whole framework built in and I was sort of just what I would consider executing in this little box. I had a little bit of free will inside this little range, but it was always my systems that told me when I was sort of in the batter bo batter's box to swing. Um, and it was basically year like seven or eight where I removed myself entirely. And th there was enough to make that final jump to have the system then basically do everything. Um, so it was, it was a 10 year process. It definitely was not something that, that, you know, happened overnight for sure. Yeah. But this is a good point. It's, it's not about sitting down one day and trying to do it all at once that day. It's about the continual process of improving and, and getting better. Absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. So, you know, documenting self-awareness and, and I, you know, I always like to try and pick on the low hanging fruit. Like what is, what can you automate? What, what is your unique edge? I think that is a very interesting question to, to ask yourself internally is what are you uniquely good at and trying to, you know, again, get those systems and frameworks to automate all the other things that you don't want to spend your mental energy on. You want to focus on if you're really good at entries, you know, you can just nail those bottoms or, you know, you're really good at those price action and early entries. Um, you should focus on that and you should build something that'll trade manage your trade if you're lousy at trade management, for instance. So something, something along those lines. Mm -hmm. What do you recommend to go with like having a strategy first, then making this a system? Or would you go about kind of creating everything at the same time, like the system and the strategy at the same time, by right? testing things? Is there one better than the other? So what I like to do is, um, you know, I, I like to try and, you know, have start from first principles as best as possible. Like I try to only test unique new ideas, for instance. So, you know, uh, I guess the way I would framework, uh, I would frame it would be um, have a, you know, have a, a, a North Star of what you're trying to accomplish. So, for instance, if you are looking at charts for years or, or months um, and, and you recognize a pattern after a stock reports earnings, there happens to be this, you know, the stock goes sideways for two days and then you see the follow through move on that day three or four, right? Or some type of thesis. Um, that's when I will then go into kind of system design or testing mode. Um, so when I have something that I have observed, I have a rationale for why that happens. Um, then I will go test that assumption. Uh, I don't like trying to just open up my back testing software and put a bunch of indicators together and make a magical equity curve because that's eventually a recipe for disaster. You're essentially just curve fitting past data and you can always find, I can guarantee you, you will always find a system that behaves wonderfully in the past, but nothing like that when you actually turn it live. So, um, yeah, having having a, a very kind of uh, original I, uh, original is a tough word, but uh, a, a different idea, and then taking it to kind of system development, if that makes sense. You probably get a lot of people that reach out to you about systems, and, and maybe they don't have the system right now, or maybe they are not able to make it profitable. What do you feel is the biggest mistake people make regarding systems? A few things. So one is um, well, what I always just kind of slow things down and ask how long they've been trading the system or strategy or idea. Um, the truth is markets, uh, I mean, you're playing with probabilities here and there's a lot of variance in markets. Uh, it's, it's not fun to say, but, you know, strategies can go weeks, months, and even a year, uh, like not making money. And that system might very well be very profitable over a long-term long horizon. So that day-to-day, week-to-week variance and people losing faith and kind of style drifting is probably the term that most people are would consider it. Um, that's a real hard thing, uh, I think, for, trader, for tra traders, for everyone, for all of us, because um, it's tough to discern when you're just flipping a coin or rolling dice and when you actually have something and when you should stick with something. So that, that, that's a big conversation. Um, but, you know, looking at how long they've been trading it is, is certainly something that I will ask. Um, and then other things uh, to, to sort of think about would be... Um, you know, certainly, 
the again the first principles of what are you trying to achieve here um, are you just mashing like five or six different indicators are you waiting for rsi to get overbought and then you're throwing in a macd you're looking at adx and then you've got three moving averages and if you're trying to just you know you're trying to just mash it all together i don't think that that's something that's not a route you really want to hang your hat on type of thing um so thinking about how markets work and what you're trying to achieve, I think is a pretty important um, conversation or way to step back and, and frame it. And, um, you know, the way I look at it is there's, there's basically only two things, two states the market can be in. It's either trending, right? There's, it's either in a markup phase or it's mean reverting. It's finding value. It's going sideways. It's, you can pretty much break down all price action into one of those two states. And therefore you could, pretty much categorize 90% of systems in one of those two states. Uh, there's, there's arbitrage and, you know, there's all kinds of other little fancy like option writing and different things you can be doing, but you're either, you know, you're either buying dips or you're, you're trend following or playing momentum. So simplifying it as best as possible, I think is, is sort of a great way to debug or think about your system or process. I found that some people in training tend to be like overly cautious and some people tend to be overly like more impulsive. Which side do you think that you fall in the most and how do you overcome that in trading? Yeah, um, I have definitely worked with both types of people. Um, it's actually tricky on thinking about which one is, is, is the worst side to be on because super conservative people um, miss out on a lot of opportunity and, um, and, or, or they just never get started. Um, they'll just continue to test and, and wait for the perfect uh, sort of, sort of setup. So, um, you know, ultimately I think this sort of ties into risk management and position size um, and, you know, kind of whatever side you're on, um, I think you just have to very slowly start to either increase that position size or shrink it down. Um, you know, there's no, it, it's, it's, it's always a, it's always a tug of war between reward and risk, right? So you want higher return. That's great. We can add leverage. We can use options. We can use futures. There's plenty of ways to get more return, but you also have to tolerate the drawdown because there's no free lunch. And if you think there's a free lunch, then you have a problem because something bad is probably going to be happening in the near future. So um, I would say, you know, in that scenario of either too aggressive or too conservative is to just, um, you know, slowly ratchet that position size, uh, just 10%, right? If, you know, if, if you trade, you know, I don't, think many people should be trading just round lots, but if you trade a hundred shares all the time uh, and, and that's conservative for a hundred thousand dollar account, let's just say, um, then, you know, the next month, why don't you start with 110 shares and just slow, you know, see how it feels, right? Br break into it. You have to be comfortable with it because this is, gets into psychology. If you're not comfortable with it, you're not going to follow it. Um, so there's, it's a tricky one, but I would say the slower, the better to sort of get in the direction that you kind of want to be. And did you find the optimal kind of number of strategies or systems for a system trader? Is it like one per rocket condition or is there like a, a good number of systems to have? Yeah, um, it's a good question. And it's, it's something I've been thinking about a lot recently. Um, you know, generally I would say the more the better, but that's not entirely true. Um, portfolio composition is a, is a, you know, is a, is a tricky thing. Um, basically, you know, you have to be looking at correlations amongst your strategies. And if you have, you know, a main strategy and you add another strategy, but it basically does the same thing, or there's like a 90 correlation on it, um, probably doesn't do a whole lot of benefit having, adding that additional strategy. So, um, you know, basically having a portfolio of the least correlated number of strategies is certainly going to be better uh, than, than just a single strategy. So I would, you know, I would say one, you know, two to five strategies, three to five strategies is probably like the sweet number there. Uh, I would be, you know, if you can find more that are uncorrelated, oh my God, then, you know, certainly add it. Uh, I, I think the, Fit, you know, th then it gets difficult uh, to really add value with sort of other strategies. But um, I do know some traders that, 
you know, trade six or seven. Uh, I don't know many that trade more than six or seven. Um, I'm sure they're out there. And if, and, and again, if, if they're uncorrelated, then diversified, then, you know, I support it. But um, yeah, somewhere, but somewhere between two to five, I think is a great sweet spot. And let's say you would start today to create a new system. How much time would it take you to create a new one and to be able to implement it? takes a while. <laughs> it takes a while. Um, yeah, for a lot of reasons. Um, yeah, I, I, I like to definitely, I'm a, I'm a big fan of just really sort of knowing the foundational North Star of, again, back to kind of first principles of why does this work? Why is this different than what I'm doing on this other system? And that's what ultimately is going to give me the confidence to basically stick with it when things get a little tougher, uh, when things, you know, when the system goes into drawdown, uh, to not want to just turn it off immediately is to actually know that testing has been done, the research is there, and um, you know, you should sort of stick with it. But that process takes a while. Um, I've got many strategies in the bullpen right now that um that i'm just sort of waiting like I, sort of still working ironing out and i'm also watching correlations because again I, I i don't want to turn on another system if it's going to almost repeat or uh, do something that i'm already doing um so yeah it's a tricky it's it's a tricky one um in terms of time but you know ultimately you know, your back test, um, you know, your back test and your kind of assumptions on why that strategy should work will, you know, certainly dictate that question um, to help you kind of get it out there. This might sound simple, but how do you evaluate the correlation on, the, on different systems? Because it could be like correlated for some time than at other times. So how do you get a fixed answer on that? Yeah, it's a good point. I mean, correlations are, are always moving, right? So the correlation I, I look in my historical data, uh, again, will give me a good ballpark, but it's still going to be a moving target going into the future. So those correlations will always change. Uh, but basically, you know, the way I'm sort of measuring correlations or the what I mean by correlations there is, is you know, essentially, um, just like the S&P 500 has a, a return every day, uh, or any stock or ETF for that matter, it has, it's up, it's down, whatever the case is, um, you're basically looking at the output of your system of what its P&L did that day. So what was its return on this particular day? And if you can get all of your systems side by side on the returns that they're generating each and every day over the past X number of years, uh, you can see how correlated they are. Do they go into drawdown at the same time? Do they come out of drawdown at the same time? Um, and just that general behavior. Um, and then you can basically simulate your uh, overall portfolio, if you allocated 50% to these two strategies, um, how does that change versus what does that re return stream look like uh, versus just 100% allocated to either one of those strategies? So that's generally, you know, how I look at it. Um, it's not perfect because, again, correlations will certainly change, um, you know, in the future. But, you know, like backtesting, it's not a silver bullet, but it's kind of the best we have to understand how a system might have performed kind of in the past. It's interesting version of stuff. And, and I'm at a point now where I'm more like toward hybrid with a mix of both systems and discretionary. So would you, would you say it's a better thing to move toward fully systematic? Or would you say that it's worth seeing it at hybrid and kind of, or maybe comparing both and how both perform? I do love the idea of hybrid. I think that is a good sweet spot for most traders. Um, you know, ultimately, there's no right or wrong for any of us, right? It's it's what's making the most money and where are you actually happy? Um, I'm a big fan. One of the terms I like to use is um, maximizing my screen time adjusted returns. So I really like the idea of um, you know, my, my perfect system or where I like to be is, is just more hands off and, and getting back my time so I can spend the time either researching new systems or strategies or coding for other traders because it improves my coding skills. And frankly, I get to see new ideas, too, that I may not have thought of. So um, so I like to sort of um, automate as much as possible. But I know plenty of traders that um, totally against systematic trading. Um, and they are uh, staunch discretionary traders and they're not going to change and they shouldn't change because if they're making money, 
don't change a thing, right? Like that, that is generally the motto is if you're happy and you're making money, don't, you know, just, just continue because you've, you've won, you've won the game of trading at that, at that point. Um, so yeah, I, I think it definitely depends for each and every person. Uh, but you know, if you've got knots in your stomach, you're not sleeping well, or, you know, you get something that's going on, um, then maybe you probably should change your strat or, you know, figure out automating more of it or less of it, you know, whatever the case is. But, um, yeah, I let the results and your gut sort of kind of guide on that question. <laughs> but I agree with you. The way I see myself too is with that that return versus the time you spent on the chart and the time you spent trading, and also the the freedom that you have or not have based on your trading style. So, yeah, it absolutely, yeah, and it and it's just so different for every for everyone. Um, you know, I, I just I know for myself, thinking about where I was ten years ago years ago, starting out as a trader, um, I probably would not consider myself, I would probably not be happy with the current version of myself. Like if I could see into the future and be like, oh my God, you, you know, you only trade, you know, you only take two trades a week. Like that's, what do you, what do, you do all the time? You're not a trader. Like well, that's nothing, right? Like, so it, it totally just depends. Uh, and, you know, I, I do some meetup groups around my local area and, and there's, you know, there's just young, aggressive you know, college students or young, or just young traders, younger people that, that just want to hit home runs and be super aggressive. And, and, and I get it. Um, so yeah, everybody's going to find their sweet spot. I agree with that. There's a sense of being proud when you take a lot of trades, especially when you're able to take it manually and be able to make money kind of with your hand manually. So that's right. Absolutely. But it might not be the right thing for most people in my opinion. Right. Yeah. I totally agree so. with you. Awesome. So are there topics we didn't cover yet that you would like to talk about or focus on? You know, I think that's that's pretty much it. I mean, um, you know, again, I, I think the message is, is sort of clear. I mean, I love I love automating and systematic trading, but it doesn't mean it's for everybody. Um, so you have to sort of find your sweet spot um, and you want to gravitate to whatever makes the most sense to you, whatever's generating the most money for you. Uh, but ultimately, you know, one of the best parts about systematic trading is that it's transparent and you can analyze it, right? You can improve upon it. You can just, you see the documented results and it's black and white. Um, and there is something very powerful to that because um, you just get to see it every day of, of, you know, there were the rules, they were executed flawlessly with no emotion, hopefully. And, um, and you can improve upon it or, or leave it or find a new system. So, yeah. Awesome. I want to give you some time to talk about what you do. So you create a system for traders, you create some for yourself, you code things for people. So just explain a bit what you do and what you have to offer. Most of my time, um, so so I, I'm a developer and, and I code uh, for Ninja Trader platform. Um, and uh, I do a lot with TC2000, uh, which is a charting platform that has a lightweight scripting language. And um, funny enough, most of... Uh, the interest that comes in from traders is through TC2000 and it's all around different scans and patterns in the market uh, that traders want to see built uh, or automated, just get those results back to them. Um, you can think of them like candlestick patterns, or you could obviously have very in-depth price action patterns too. Um, so yeah, I spend uh, a good amount of, of my day coding for traders that want to automate part of their trading back test their trading uh, or have scans or certain trading tools built out. Um, so I, I am pretty picky in the sense that I really only look at those three platforms. Um, so I'm not a Python guy or I don't do TradeStation or any of that stuff. I'm kind of stuck in my, uh, my certain platforms that, that, I, that I stay in. Um, but uh, yeah, that is a lot of my day is, is sort of spent there and I really enjoy doing it and uh, it's led to some, some good conversations and uh, some good ideas, really, uh, some traders out there. Interesting. I'm curious to hear on that topic. Is there one language that is better than others for some aspect, like allowing, allowing you to do more things or more maybe simplicity or something? Yeah. So um, I don't know. The, w the way I sort of frame it uh, out there in terms of the in terms of programming languages, especially for traders, is you're either kind of go down the Python route, which is just exploding in popularity uh, over the past five, six years. Uh, there's so many more libraries and great features and add-ins to that language that make Python 
really attractive. Um, so I, you know, I find that like the quantitative traders are either on that route or they're in kind of the Microsoft ecosystem, which would be like a C sharp and like, um, you know, Microsoft Excel, C sharp, C. Um, and that is actually where I, uh, sit in is that camp. Um, mostly because that's what I learned, uh, as a comp sci student, there was really no Python in the curriculum back then. Um, you know, I can certainly dabble in it, but my strengths are more on kind of the CC sharp. So, um, those are kind of the two, those are the, really the two big languages I would sort of look at right now. There's obviously other programming languages you could code in, but, um, there seems to be a lot in either one of those two camps and it's really going to sort of depend on the software that you're using. Um, so uh, I use Ninja Trader, which is uh, got a free back tester. So you can download the software and you get access to uh, a pretty sweet product uh, to test. Uh, you obviously have to be able to code. So um, they have a lightweight kind of gooey version that you could sort of create a strategy, a simple one. Um, so that's always an option. And funny enough, I do a lot with Microsoft Excel. Uh, you can actually push that pretty hard. Um, and, and in fact, I have a trading system that is running automated through Microsoft Excel, uh, which is hilarious. Uh, it's a low frequency system. So it's not like a day trading system. I wouldn't recommend trying to do anything like on minute bars or five, anything intraday, like it, it'd be a little tough. Um, cause it's just a slow latency, but I have Microsoft Excel hooked up to IBKR and it transmits orders. Uh, it does all the recording. It'll send out notifications to me, to my phone, text alerts. Uh, it's a pretty interesting, uh, kind of piece of technology. Granted, it's like a 10 year old 15 year old piece of technology, but it still works. And I quite honestly love it. Um, so Excel is, is still pretty powerful, uh, for traders even nowadays. Nice. Definitely not modern, but definitely really interesting and, and yeah, really nice. That's cool. So where can people find you if they want to connect with you or reach out after this podcast? Well, I mean, this, this will be on YouTube. So I'm pretty active on YouTube. Um, so uh, the channel is The Trade Risk. Um, publish a lot of videos there. And I get a new series that I'm going to start doing a lot more um, uh, instructional videos on how to code and how to actually test uh, some strategies. Um, so that um, hopefully will be rolling out, starting to roll out over the next month or so. Um, but I'm excited about that to sort of, um, you know, do some research and do some programming kind of at the same time. So that'll be on YouTube, the trade risk, um, the website, the trade risk and Twitter, uh, the trade risk or Evan Medeiros, uh, pretty easy to find kind of all around. Awesome. We'll make sure to link all of that below in the description or the show notes for the podcast, of course. And what kind of goals have you in the future, Evan? So, um, I have a, big document of research projects and strategies and ideas that I do want to test. Um, I like, like the, the series that I want to start doing on, on, um, teaching people how to code and, and to start, um, getting data around the ideas, uh, that they're thinking about, um, is something I want to continue to push forward. Uh, I, I, I'm, I'm very interested in sort of, um, elevating the conversation and just asking better questions. And, and a lot of the things, which I think is in, you know, a thing that I've been thinking of recently is there's a lot of things that traders take for granted. Um, you know, there's these cliche moving averages or you know, just to pick on moving averages, but it could be any number of things, but there's a lot of things that people assume work. And when you actually run the numbers uh, and you test those assumptions, they, may not work as good as you may think. Um, so I'm fascinated with just can, kind of continuing uh, to push along better research education in that space, because I think um, I'm certainly interested in it and hopefully it'll be useful for other people too. Awesome. That's really interesting for sure. Cool. And so I like to ask this, this last question to my guests usually on the podcast. So the question is, if you could give people one piece of advice on how they can thrive as systems trader, what would that one piece of advice be? So generally, uh, my go-to on this is um, to document everything. Now, for systems traders, that's pretty easy. Um, generally, you know, for, especially for the non-system traders, it's 
document and journal everything uh, because ultimately that's the way you're going to improve. That's the way you're going to actually get better. Um, if I had to carve it out for systems traders, um, you know, I would, I would sort of take a step back and again, think about what you're trying to achieve and really break it down to like how markets work. What is your perception of markets? What are you actually trying to accomplish with your trading system? Um, why do you think that works? Um, and it should be fairly easy to explain, um, you know, in terms of what you're going after and uh, what you're trying to achieve. So yeah, I, I, I think that would be my long winded answer is to kind of simplify things. Um, you know, take a step back, um, the basic questions are often the best questions to ask yourself. Um, so that's what I'd recommend. Awesome. Ivan, that's really good. I appreciate the advice and the insights you gave me and my, my fans. Oh, super awesome. I hope they connect with you and they reach out to you and, and they, they go see your YouTube channel and, and everything. And I hope to uh, talk to you soon. Awesome. Thanks so much. All right. Awesome. Thank you very much.